Bonjour. Bonjour. Fantastic. So now you're all focused. Uh, welcome from the Palais de Festival, the main stage um, here in Cannes. My name is Sten Salver. I'm the strategic advisor at Cannes Next. And now I stop speaking. Um, but I have a great pleasure to introduce this panel with Artini. And I think in the next hour or so, we're going to explore really, really interesting venues around distribution. Of course, we all know that COVID has been having quite drastic effects, how audiences access films, consume films, and so forth. And although the theatrical has a lot of challenges, I think a lot of exciting opportunities are opening up. And those, are, those opportunities are around community screenings, safe distribution, and so forth. And we have a quite a long relationship with Artini here at Cam Next, so thank you for coming back. Um, it's quite an amazing technology company out of Czech Republic, and they're really trying to carve a very unique niche and an opportunity where there's a lot of work to be done. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Wendy to start the conversation. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Stan, for hosting us at Can Next. Uh, my name is Wendy Mitchell. I am a journalist and festival consultant, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator today. We've got some amazing experts um, from various points in the value chain, I would say. And uh, just also to mention, we will be welcoming questions from you, the audience, both the audience live here in the Palais and to everyone joining us online. So please submit your questions at any time. You don't even have to wait till the end. We'll keep an eye on them here through the magic of a iPad. Other tablets are available. Um, but let's start, I think. You know, we're, we're talking about the changing landscape of distribution and maybe some new tools that can help the industry at this time of change. And of course, our hosts today are Artini, and I would love to hand it over to Betty and Viet from Artini to tell us a little bit more about the company and what you offer, and that will help set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Please. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll be short, I, uh, at least I will try to be short because we have a great guest here. But I want to tell you a little bit about our history, how it came, the idea. So even it happened all, almost 15 years ago, when my uh, business partner, Stirat, who is here with us as well, uh, ran a spiritual cinema film festival. And he found a lot of films, but at the end he was not able to get licenses. Either didn't find where to get it, or the producers didn't reply. So at the end, he had a problem to find the, the films. On the other hand, he realized it's so popular that he, that he had to add screenings at 2 o'clock in, in the morning because it was completely sold out. So after another eight years, we met, discussed that because he ran it a few times and always happened the same. So we realized there is a strong community of people who would like to see films. They don't know where to find the films, and even they, if they find them, they won't get the license. So we discussed it, and something like, as I said, seven years ago, we started to build the first idea of Artini. Two and a half years ago, we found an investor who helped us to develop everything much faster, and we started with the idea of the community-driven distribution. And then, unfortunately, as we everybody know, last March, the COVID came, just two weeks before we want to launch the original idea. So we sat again, and open our notes we made, in fact, here in Cannes, in the last pre-COVID film festival in May 2019. And then we realized that everybody told us it's a great idea, but they don't know how to deliver the film safely. Because even, even now, what we've got, what's your options? Either DCP, which is huge, expensive, or what, DVD, USB stick, Vimeo, it's not safe at all. So again, we sat again and discussed how to do that different way, because we think that everybody, doesn't matter if you have like multi-million film or a student shorty, you deserve to have your film protected, doesn't matter where you send it. So this is how we definitely completely changed in the last two years, and we are happy we are here now and can, can present our tools. And I'll pass now the word to my colleague Betty, who will tell you a little bit more about our tools. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Artini Marketplace is actually the original idea that the company was founded on, and the marketplace is very much alive and functional. Uh, we sell licenses for non-theatrical public screenings, and from there, our ecosystem of products developed. Uh, we added a white label solution, which is a copy of the marketplace, but you can add your branding. You can sell your licenses for your films for non-theatrical screenings, or you can use the TVOD option, which we've now also added. Um, the content delivery is at the center of everything. Everything resolves and rotates around single sends. And that's the same concept for the film festival platform. Uh, we offer a true hybrid solution for festivals. So you can host your event in the online space for people at home. And you can host a screening in the brick and mortar location. Everything is handled from one dashboard where you upload your pre-rolls and post-rolls and commercials, Q&As, set the geo-blocking pricing, and off you go. So we offer a complex solution, which is tied together with the Artini Cinema proprietary player. And we can touch on why it's so important in terms of security again. Thank you. As we mentioned that safety, security, anti-piracy is very important for us. We talk about it almost daily. And this is the core of our system, the technology and the safety. I'll just briefly explain what will happen with your film if you work with us. The most important thing is there is no human touch at all. Once you upload the film to us, it's moved to a non-public server, not accessible from the internet. The film is immediately encrypted and waiting, waiting there. When another system will find out there is a request for the film, it's re-encrypted by industry standard DRM. We use PlayReady and Widewine. And the very important is we add forensic watermarks. Not just on the video, as you know, but we also use a very advanced audio, audio uh, watermarks. It's a patented Israeli technology, which is working on a computer white noise level, so you cannot find it, you cannot remove it. In fact, it's a very, very uh, strong one. Uh, then, when the film is ready, it's watermarked, it's encrypted, it's sent to a public server, and our player is notified. So when you have our player installed, and it's running in the background, then it finds out your film is ready, and the download will automatically start. And then it's ready for the, for the playing. The film is decrypted on the fly just during the screening. It's never, ever available nowhere in the space, on the hard drive, or cloud, in the decrypted form. So it's always encrypted. So even if someone would steal it, it's not able to read it or do whatever with that. All our entire uh, technology is, uh, at the moment, US patent pending. I just want to show you something which we are releasing right now in a couple of days. Uh, we even develop some small another enhancement, which we call La Check the License app. With this app, uh, if you're sitting at a screening provided by us, by our Artini player, in less than a minute you will get an information for which location and for how many people was the film sold. Yeah, so it's like another check for you that like someone will ask you to, to have a screening for 20 friends and then you will find out, you know, his screening at a uh, football stadium for uh, 500 people. That's another additional step. Yeah, and the player is important because all the films licensed and sold or de delivered by Artini can only be played through the player, as we mentioned. We have a couple of versions. Um, all the brick and mortar screenings should happen through the downloaded version of the player, which is available both for Windows and, and Apple. Um, we have a version for the people at home, which is browser based but they still can use the downloaded version if they choose to. Uh, the biggest advantage is that the screening is not reliant on internet, once, which is fantastic for screenings in remote locations or in areas where internet coverage is perhaps not so great. And we're working on, on and we're gonna release it soon actually, apps for mobile phones for Android and for iOS and for smart TVs where you can use the player as well and once the film starts playing, our server is notified after 60% have been screened, 
and all the information about the screening is stored in blockchain. So in terms, if there is a dispute, hopefully there is none, we can access the information and provide secure data for <laughs> the user on the other end. Great, thank you. I think that really helps us understand a little bit, but I, I'd like to even go a little bit deeper and it always helps me when we're talking about technology to see it in use or to hear how real life people and real life industry is using your solutions already. So I know you've worked with a brand called Kofokino. Yeah, we Kofo. worked with Kofola. Yes, Kofola um, is the brand, a, and then yes. Kofokino. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Kofola is a soft drinks company. It's huge in Central Europe, and last year they wanted to help the businesses that were struggling, and they asked us to collaborate on this project to do outdoor cinemas. So imagine bars, restaurants, campsites, um, you name it, <laughs> where Kofola is sold. And it was a nice experience for the people who enjoy the drink. Together, it was allowed. Uh, all the restrictions were eased in the Czech Republic. Nothing illegal in these pictures. Nothing illegal is happening in the images. Or film piracy, <laughs> of course. So no, fantastic. Yeah, looks yeah. great. So Kofola actually be became the largest cinema chain at one point because we hosted more than 200 screenings. And this year we expect over 600 even. Yeah, they to increase. Pretty, 600. Yeah, yeah, the collaboration is continuing this year. Screenings are happening even this weekend and it continues. And we play the part of content delivery. So that's the very basic tool. And everyone at the location simply can hit play. It's very simple. All you need is a laptop, a projector, and a screen, and the event can happen. And an audience. And an audience, yes. of course. Amazing. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> and Great. all of this is based on the basic technology which we called uh, RTNA content delivery. It's something which we call delivery as a service. So that's something you can get easily. We don't own the license. It's your still your license. You just send it to the locations where you need it. Okay. And uh, we have some amazing experts joining us both on stage and remotely. So I'd like to start to bring them in. I think we're going to first, why don't I talk to Brian Newman, who's joining us, I think, from New York. And he runs subgenre films. He has been a producer. He's, gosh, he's worked in the film industry for quite a few decades, a real veteran. And, you know, Brian, you have a lot of experience working with brands setting up strategy for collaborations and, you know, seeing something like this uh, one with the Cola brand. How do you see the potential for brands to look at a solution like this as an opportunity? Yeah, I think it's great. Thanks for having me, um, calling in for, or Zooming in from New York. And I do a lot of work with brands that are sponsoring films and are funding the making of films and the distribution of films. And just like the Kofala example, I think you can see that a lot of brands would be able to come together and put together their own curated screenings and festivals of films. So for example, I do a lot of work with Patagonia, the outdoor brand, and there's a lot of people who make films about skiing and hiking and mountain climbing and things like that. And they're called mountain film festivals. And they can now partner with their stores around the world or their customers around the world and set up outdoor screenings and have a festival of films for the for their fans. Or you could imagine someone like Nike sponsoring a tour of out of um, sports films and getting people, you know, whether it's in a um, outdoor screening like Kofala did or in a stadium, it could really be anywhere. And the way the technology has been built, it could also be viewed online. So if someone's at home, they could use the same technology to participate in the festival, even if they weren't there in person. And what's great about it is the way the technology works, you know, it could be sent to a bar or a restaurant and it's easy. And that's one of the biggest things is the brand can now trust that their customers who are setting it up um, can do so with uh, with an ease of mind that they're not having to get a DCP and figure out how that works. They can just put it on their computer, plug it in, and it works. Great. And have you actually experienced the technology yourself? It sounds like you're familiar with it. Yes. Yeah, I've experienced the technology in tests. But what I really like about it is uh, we did a tour 
for uh, Patagonia prior to this technology existing. And we showed films in over 600 cities around the world, um, everywhere from Europe, China, South Korea, uh, Brazil. And it was a nightmare to organize because it was a technological hurdle for everyone to set up these screenings. And if we had had this technology, it would have been simple. And so that's the thing I'm looking forward to, is now being able to set up cinemas anywhere in the world uh, it, really with just a laptop and plugging it into a projector, which is great. Wonderful. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we have live in the room Ted Hope, one of the great veterans of independent film and also quite a visionary, um, always looking ahead, always looking to the future. And Ted, I know you can do you know, a whole day of a masterclass on the future of distribution, but uh, how are you thinking about this changing world? you know, how rights holders' uh, needs might be changing. Can you just give us a little thoughts on the state of the play right now? Sure, sure. Thank you, Wendy. It's uh, great to be here with everybody. Um, I kind of feel like, you've, you know, you've all heard, I imagine if you're rock and roll fans, you've heard legends of, like, there was a band called the Velvet Underground, and 17 people went to see the first show. And the remarkable thing was they all started rock bands. Same thing with the Sex Pistols, right? This is that moment right now. You're watching the Velvet Underground or the Sex Pistols on stage, and you're going to go and seize the technology to start your own rock band. We'll see, right? Like, I, I, I see it a little bit like this. Like, I've been super fortunate in my career. I've been able to be involved with about 125 films, and I think a lot of it comes down to one question, which is why do we keep settling for just what is? Why do we accept this world as it is? We have a film ecosystem that works. Why bother try to make it better? Why bother? Because I see plenty of good movies that never get made into great. I see many great movies that never get seen and never reach their audiences. You know what you have in your catalog. You know what you've made. You know what, how it affects people and audiences when they get the opportunity. And let's be super real. It doesn't work right now. It hasn't ever worked. I've been able to have a great career because I keep saying, why does this not work better? And I've been super fortunate along my career to a few times see some things that can improve it. Because I had done that, I had the opportunity to spend the, the last six years working with this guy named Jeff Bezos. You might have heard of him. He's had a couple good ideas in his life. Mm -hmm. And one time I asked him, I said, like, Jeff, that question, why aren't things better in everywhere? And he said a really simple answer that is actually being answered on the stage like right now, which was in any industrialized ecosystem, there are a host of operational improvements that will make things a hell of a lot better. But nobody goes and addresses them because they think good is good enough. They don't deploy the capital to make the improvement because they're betting on a gold rush instead of a consistent, sustainable return. Whether you're a rights holder or an artist, an entrepreneur, and you want to use this incredible thing call, called film to bring people together and hopefully change their lives and maybe generate some, some money, you know, you have to start to say, how do we make it better? What are those operational improvements? And that's what I try to, you know, in Amazon fashion, they say, develop pattern recognition for. I try to keep my eyes open for what are those little steps that can make things a lot better. I think as you've heard, like particularly in, in you know, this timing of a global pandemic with the shift of our industry from one that was once a single title revenue-based business to what is now under global streaming, completely different. It's an audience acquisition business. That business requires the companies that are in it to make a lot of content really fast on a regular basis. And if you've lived through the last two, three, five years, you know what happens to those movies. They disappear. They get buried under this onslaught. So I keep wondering, what do we do? What do we do to make sure that we bring the people who love movies around these films that have already been made and their value and utility have not been extracted? And I look for things. So 
I, I have to give Curl, you know, credit with credit is due. Like he and, uh, you know, Brian, uh, both are uh, friends in in uh, in the states that I talked to about these advances in a regular business, and they, he was like, "Man, have you heard of Artini? Have you seen what they can do?" And like that idea of a simple, easy to use platform that both allows you to reach large communities with the titles that you control the rights to, or home audiences in a one-step basis that can be geo-blocked, that you can set your license terms, that people can you you know use in an easy way, to me is one of those things that unlocks that potential. It is a game changer. I just taught you how to play the guitar. I hope you have a song to sing. Go out there and be Lou Reed, Sid Vicious, and Johnny Rotten of the film business because you have everything you need now, thanks to Artini. I'm not a pitch man. I'm an honest enthusiast when I see something, and I want to help. That's amazing. Yeah, I should say, Thank Ted you. is not a paid spokesman for Artini. He's just somebody who has been introduced to this technology and can see the potential, and amazing. Yes, I hope everybody sees Todd Haynes' Velvet Underground film to further inspire you. Um, let's come to Carol Martesco Fenster, another veteran, another visionary. Um, he's joining us uh, from the blue skies of Vermont behind him, I believe. Um, Carol, you've actually used this technology, and that's why you knew it was something to tell people like Ted about. Can you tell us, um, you, you worked, I think, with 12 documentaries through Abramarama, um, which is your sort of indie distribution outfit. Can you, can you tell us about what you did and how it worked? Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> so I just probably want to try to start real quickly. Um, uh, like everyone else, when the pandemic hit, as a distributor at Abramarama, we were immediately faced with no theaters, um, how do we still continue to get our films out to an audience? Um, we did a lot of things in the online space, but we also wanted to be prepared to, when theaters come back, when there's an ability to have outdoor screenings, how can we do that? And in fact, there were outdoor screenings happening during the pandemic, but um, very few ways to get the actual film to those outdoor screenings in a secure fashion and in an efficient and a quick fashion. And we stumbled across our teeny and began to explore uh, what to do uh, and how to utilize the technology. Um, fast forward, um, in February of this year, uh, we launched a pilot white label with six music documentaries, that's our speciality, uh, to start testing the system and make that available. Um, uh, one thing went to the next, and we wanted to start um, delivering films to uh, places outside of the US in a safe and secure fashion um, without using DCPs or Blu-rays or anything like that. And we had a couple of films that were looking to have some world premieres. Uh, and in June, we actually delivered the first uh, film via Artini for a world premiere of a film called Upheaval that was taking place in Jerusalem uh, in a relatively large theater. Um, and that went completely seamlessly. And the amazing thing for us is that we have our staff is able to upload the file to Artini from a desktop, add the subtitles, do everything that's necessary, and authorize the views for the end user. The end user downloads the Artini Cinema Player, which is really easy, very simple, and uh, with their computer connected to their projector, to the screen, boom, they show the film. That was the first instant that we used it. We then had another uh, world premiere at the Muhammad Ali Center for our film City of Ali. Uh, we authorized 20 screenings. They showed the film 20 times at the center. Again, everything very seamless. We were informed when actually one of the venues tried to show the film an additional time. They didn't have the authorization. Uh, we then reauthorized the film. Everything from uh, the laptop of my colleague who's actually running uh, the system. So it was quite easy. Um, we're also very excited because what we're doing right now is we're testing it with some theaters here in the U.S. Uh, because we've just solicited our first film uh, to all of the theaters that we work with in the U.S. And we're offering it up with a DCP or another online DCP or Artini. Um, so we see a world in which uh, we're going to be utilizing this technology for screenings that are in theaters. But also, we're very excited about utilizing the technology to deliver films that we work with 
into far from places um, all over uh, that, are not, that might not even have a theater. Um, so we're excited by that prospect. Thanks, Carl. That sounds like a great experience that you guys at Ramarama have had. We've got another veteran and visionary with us. I, it's a shame we don't have somebody who's just an idiot on the panel to shake things up. Um, but we have Daniel Barr from K5 in Germany who's here with us. And you've been also doing a sort of white label project. Can you tell us about it and what your experience has been and what the future could be? Happy to do that. Um, yeah, also thanks for my side having me here on the on the panel. Um, yeah, we, that, uh, we are K5, so we are K5 International. We are a sales company and production company with K5 Film. And for us, I would say, as over the years, I would say we've been also very fortunate to work with uh, really lots of great directors over the years, with Tom McCarthy, where we had The Visitor, or also we did with Amazon together, with uh, Ted uh, Patterson, where we were here five years ago with Jim Jambo's movie here at the uh, Cannes competition. So over the years we built really a great library of, of films and we as producers but also as a sales agent we obviously look at ways okay how can we bring really the films to to the people and obviously yeah one way is the subscription model the other way is you just go via the aggregator but then still um, so over the last years like when we looked at our catalog it's always our course is like these these uh, these white places in the in the world map where you always know okay in some territories you just don't find the TV station that takes the film out or maybe even sometimes Sometimes also uh, iTunes or, or, or they, they also don't take the film for certain territories. So for us, we said it would be really terrible just to leave this to piracy, and we want to find a way how we, as uh, as rights holder, as producers, stage agents, how can we get the film to to uh, to the to the audience? And then also, Carol, I know from movie with uh, we uh, sold some time ago called Sing Your Song from Harry Belafonte, and then he told me about Artini. And also said like, oh great, this is really exactly what we're looking for. So we got in touch with the guys, and so they explained everything. And then I said, this is this is really this is really like one of the missing puzzle pieces that we need out there, so that we as rights holders can really get directly in touch with the audience, because uh, the bigger companies are not interested in that, because that's really an area like like Ted really explained very wonderful enough money. But for us, uh, I would say it's very important to be seen and that the film are, are out there and uh, yeah and so we st st started the process with the white label solution that they have and um, uh, I would say within one week we had our like our already large part of our catalog out there which was really which was really cool so um, so therefore we're starting now to use that system so we are unlocking certain territories but the future idea is really so that we will be able then on a non-exclusive basis to sell the film directly to the to the audiences and uh, also use the film festival version but we are really more, more focused on the tv for the start great and ted do you want to come back i here? just wanted to touch uh, uh, on a point on a point there you know that in this changing ecosystem the one that is now dominated by global streaming there's something that they really can't do and that they won't ever do, I believe, based on, on my experience, which, which is actually focus on curating, on focusing on matching the audience with the titles that they will like best, and to carry you know, within that package of film, a message of some sort. That, that's what I think of curating. It's not just like this title for you. It also carries with it a context with, with it. And I think that anyone who specializes in curating, and that's distributors, that's producers, that's sales agents, in this shifting world, can no longer afford to not, to not build a direct relationship with customers, with audiences across the world. Whether you're based in a small territory or else, 
elsewhere, this is the moment where you also get the opportunity to use rock and roll as an example again, to you have your record label actually mean something, you know, like wh whether that was A&M Records or Blue Note Records or Sub Pop Records or any RCA, you know, anything that people understand that within this genre there there is a focus, that becomes a necessity for curators. So when you have a, a library uh, of films, whether that's 10 films or 100 films, you know, you want to use those assets to help strengthen the, that brand so what people come to you for, your expertise in selection and proper contextualization can travel throughout the world. So looking for those tools, again, you know, we think about this as just about bring films to audiences wherever they may not have gotten them, you actually also have to bring, let's call it your brand, you know, your, your expertise to those customers. It's an opportunity for a win-win-win uh, uh, opportunity, not just, you know, two, but more, where the, the, the rights holders, the artists, creators, and the audiences also win, and of course, I guess in that one, Artini will win too. So four wins. Okay. But if one uh, question, I could, if I, if I could uh, just add one quick thing to that, because uh, Ted just uh, unlocked a very key word, which is curate. Um, you know, I was speaking about what we do, which was just a f one film, film point to point distribution. Uh, there's a number of things with this technology that are uh, eight, you're able to do that's unbelievable, and one of them is to actually curate and collect films in a one deliverable file. It is extremely easy for us, which is how actually we started with the idea of these six music films that we curated on our white label. Uh, you can actually tie these files together so that you can use our team to deliver a curated collection of music films to any point on the planet. So I just wanted to add that because that's what one of the things that sort of jump started us. We've now expanded, we have something like 15 films on the white label, and it's also impact documentaries. But that curation and using a tool to curate and deliver is uh, really something exciting uh, for those rock and rollers, as Ted says out there. Thanks, Carol. Daniel, did you want to say something? I had one question to Ted, because uh, I'm not sure if I'm quoting right, but I think in the, in the book when you're talking about the long tail business, at one point you were very skeptical, like with all the experience you had uh, from, from the past. So I would be curious to know from your side, with your experience, like how do you, like how big do you see this really this long tail market? Because uh, yeah, at some point I think it said something like, okay, n the movies that we all love, they're like, they're very limited people, amount of people that really want to watch them. So it's maybe just us or so like, how do you see that area? Yeah, I, I think um, Daniel's uh, mentioning, I, I, I wrote a book called Hope for Film. I encourage you all to, to read it. It's in its second edition now, more to follow. Um, and there's some quote to the, the extent of all the hope I had for, for both long tail and kind of DIY distribution, the opportunity for you know artists, entrepreneurs to earn a consistent living, albeit perhaps small, uh, from the work they uh, create. And I think the quote was something about how the long tail got stomped, you know, by the, you know, elephant herd or tsunami, I think I used both metaphors, um, uh, 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 of creation. And there's a real truth to that. But I think like this is again one of those opportunities that we're living in right now that is to me a perfect storm to revision how our film ecosystem works. And the current you know, dominance of global streaming adrenalizes, you know, uh, fuels even more content creation, you know, that that Disney and uh, Paramount Plus and, and Netflix have all said their business model now for creation is one film or releasing is one new film a week. And they do that to target audience segments. And there's many more audience segments than one. You know, I think Netflix says is 300 something, but generally most people, you know, uh, coalesce around maybe 15. So that's not 15, that's not one film a week, that's 15 films a week. Now you could say the audience segments overlaps, you don't need that many, maybe it's five, 
But what happens there? How do you actually make your, your film live forever? I don't think anyone goes into this business hoping people watch their film for one day and then shuts up, right? You know, so what becomes clear is that, that the business of global streaming, it is super short term. The, the, the life cycle or shelf life or decay curve, whatever language you want to have for titles on platforms is super rapid. They have no interest in getting you to watch things from the past, right? Now we can cry into our soup or we can actually, beer may be a better, better uh, thing in this case, or we can say like, here's a tremendous opportunity because when they stop caring, maybe we can move something else in its place. And I would argue that, that those rights holders, whether they're again producers, distributors, or, or, or sales agents, actually have a moral and ethical obligation to keep the films alive for as long as possible. So we have to start to think into it, how do we create new marking events to bring the conversations back? The one thing that really has made, you know, uh, movies that are ambitiously authored uh, global that allows these films to work in places like the Cannes Film Festival is word of mouth. It, you know, word of mouth to really catch fire requires what? A, an event that is IRL, right? You know, that is in real life, that is actually social, that has people talking and seeing each other. And when you have a social experience, that's where that conversation sparks. So as a producer, what I'm trying to do now is think, okay, what am I going to do after they stop marketing my film six weeks on a digital platform? How do I keep it alive? I believe that, that we will, and uh, Carol and I have been involved with a, a film recently that has been able to hold on to its non-theatrical rights, hold on to its uh, transactional rights. And I think each of the, that's business, but it's also marketing events that rejuvenate a title after the, the streamers, you know, have chewed it up and spit it out, how do we make it? How do we make it live again? And this is what what's needed. That's how we start to give life to a, uh, to the long tail. I love that concept. I was so excited when I first came into it, and I really felt like we got crushed under the the realization. It's about he he or she who or they who who yells the the loudest gets the most attention, and that requires both scale and capital. But I think as this world starts to pivot and actually mature, it starts to come back in the hands of the fans, the, uh, 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 the organizations that, that have a stake in these types of titles, whether it's, as Brian mentioned, outdoor sports or spiritual organizations or any of these human rights so, sorts of things. Bringing people together is so powerful and you need a way to do it. And so, yes, okay, I'm gonna admit here, there's new hope for the long tail. I'm not gonna give Martini full credit for this, but I actually have new hope for it, so. That's good to hear. And I think it's a necessity. Yeah, that'll be great for this industry if that is true. Um, we've been talking about curation, and obviously, and we're here in Cannes, we're at a film festival, IRL, for those of us on stage, and it's magnificent to be back. Um, Betty, can you tell us, because I think you, Artini has worked with some festivals, um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about Check That Film and how that, that worked and how Artini might, can work either physical or online or hybrid festivals. Yeah, that's a nice link because Check That Film is an initiative actually funded by the government. It's to promote Czech culture and film in the United States and in Canada. So their content is very tailored to their audience. It's a niche audience, mainly expats uh, living in the United States and in Canada, or some people who are learning Czech for whatever reason. <laughs> and they tailor um, new content every single year. They pick new movies that have come out recently. They've been doing it for 10 years. And every single year, it's been an in-person event, uh, screenings in different small cinemas, outdoor cinemas. And due to the pandemic, they had to move it online. Mm. 
So they used our platform, they invited their contributors, they uploaded some films themselves. It was both features, documentaries, as well as shorts. And every single feature was accompanied by a 25 to 30 minute Q&A with the director, which was super special. And it was locked in a playlist and delivered both to the locations as well as the people at home. So it was a little bonus um, to the audience or for the audience. And because the states were slowly opening up, we were adding live events every single week. So that shows the versatility of the app and the platform because you can decide, oh, tomorrow we're able to do a rooftop screening in New York and they've done it, do or it. a few in Texas and in LA. So that's how Check That Film has used it and the audience was happy. We launched the browser version of the player for the first time and it was 50-50, which was a surprise for us that some people immediately went to download the player were like, that's easy, ah. done. And some people went through the online version. So that's check that film. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian, I know I get your newsletter every week and I encourage people to sign up for that. Uh, you're always thinking about the future of this business and a lot about the future of film festivals as well. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you how you see festivals, this again could be a day masterclass, how you see festivals evolving um, in terms of maybe hybrid events and how so new tools are gonna be needed for those. Yeah, we've definitely come into the era of the hybrid film festival, but the problem has been if you look behind the scenes, it's a Frankenstein of different <laughs> technologies. So the organizers are, you know, have a DCP over here, a Vimeo link over here. They're pulling an H.264 file off Dropbox over here, and they're trying to put all this together. And it's been good enough, as Ted says, uh, but hasn't been able to scale because the technology hasn't been there. And that's what Artini does is it's kind of said we can put it all in one package and it's going to be simple for people to use. They can download the entire film festival to their computer in just a matter of moments. It's safe, it's secure, and it's cheap and easy. And they, and they built it so that you can do that screening, you know, whether it's in a church or a stadium or outdoors at a drive-in, and you can also offer it online. And it makes it very simple and secure. And so, you know, when you want to think about new paradigms, often what's missing is that technology that allows it to actually happen and go further. And that's what our teenies built, and that's what makes this so exciting. Great, thank you. I wanted to ask a few questions to the group. I just wanted to acknowledge that I am getting some questions from the audience, and we'll get to those. Thank you for your good questions. Um, you know, I think everybody here is at some point a producer as well. So I'm just curious about how you see the, maybe the role of producers or the economic model that producers work with evolving with the help of some of these kinds of new technologies. And Ted, you mentioned, I know you're working on a project that involves a spiritual icon, shall we say, and you're able to keep some of those rights. And how do you, is that the future of producing? Uh, let me, well, I <laughs> but, you know, it, it's curious, like, uh, I can, I can take it back uh, a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, I had the good fortune of being involved in a movie called 21 Grams. And when we did that deal, uh, it was clear we could never, you know, to get the film made, we couldn't have the fees that we felt we deserved. And, uh, you know, luckily, um, right at that time, there was a uh, young man that had just graduated from grad school and written a good thesis on kind of a new way of doing business. And Endeavor seized him up, and uh, his name was Modi Witsik, and went on to create M MRC. But he made the suggestion, I'll give him full uh, credit for it, that we retain rights that we might value and the studio wouldn't care that much about. So suffice it to say that Spain and Mexico for that film was worth a really pretty penny, you know, when that uh, when we had that film financed and held, and later once the film delivered its results, it could be monetized. You've probably heard of a guy named George Lucas, right? <laughs> and, and you know he did the same thing, and that's what that inspiration was back in the day. Star Wars, you want the toy rights to this movie? Like, okay, we can't pay you, but you get to keep the toy rights. 
I think Good luck, that, George. You know, yeah, yeah, but that's worked out well. You know, yeah. absolutely. And and I think that, that the, you know, why do studios, why do distributors, why do platforms uh, take rights, all rights in perpetuity when they don't actually use them? Because they can. And we don't need to let, let that happen. I was super fortunate. I made a movie early in my career that nobody wanted. Right, it was by a, a, it was a film. People looked at it, and they said, "Who wants this film? It's gay. It's Chinese, and feels like a film from the '40s." That film won the Berlin F Film Festival. It was for a young director named Ang Lee. Um, the movie was called The Wedding Banquet, and because all the sales agents passed on it, my par business partner and I had to sell it ourselves. We were ignorant fools, right? So we sold it ourselves, and we had the gall to say we would like to license it for six years. They were like, these kids don't know what they're doing. Like, fine, like we'll do a six-year license. Those companies all then sold their local territorial rights to the television broadcasters who tended to have a 15-year license. Don't worry about it. These guys will be dead and gone by the time you know, uh, the, 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 the rights came up. So, you know, we, we did a um, 42 times uh, return on investment on that movie. Um, and then we re-upped six years later for exactly the same amount because it was a six-year license and they had it. And I use these examples. is like there's so much that is undervalued. And the truth is those larger companies are never going to exploit these rights. You know, there's real opportunity in them, their hills. We just have to dig for it, right? And I think that those sort of things of just saying like, okay, fine, you're not willing to pay me enough for my film. I'm going to hang on to these countries uh, on my own, right? Because I have a tool that allows me to exploit it now. Like that's been the problem. We've had a business of middlemen and people that take skim all, all, all off the fees as opposed to actually having the tools that allow us to do the work and that is exactly you know curiously enough if I may just like this is one of the things like like what I get excited about in the film business is that time and time again the best and the brightest the most powerful and the most rich entities make dumbass decisions right <laughs> We should all be super thankful for that because that's our opportunity to get our you know bread buttered a little bit, and uh, you can just look at what happened to the American studios, right? They had the the arrogance and the gall to think they had everything they needed to stay the most powerful entities, because in America you can't sign the creators of the IP or the talent behind the camera to long-term contracts anymore, you know, uh, after the, the, you know, antitrust laws. And, and as a result, the, the studios always felt we need two things basically to stay the most powerful control in, in control of the medium, and that's capital and distribution. But to them, those words meant physical distribution and their capital was puny compared to what the companies that actually built the digital distribution accumulated, right? So five years later, the Fang companies had so much capital they could buy on hand, underutilized, they could buy any of the studios. But at the same time when that conversation, when that story was being told, they were still sleeping at the wheel about to crash into that Big Mac truck because they didn't realize that they didn't have the most important piece for all of us to have, which is a direct relationship to the audience, right? So once the, the digital companies had that and they found out they had another power of data mining to actually understand all of your behaviors, good or bad, we can talk about that later. I know Brian <laughs> has some opinions, but like that they, they had another revenue source a as a result. Once again, Artini and other tools like that give you the opportunity to develop a direct relationship with the audience, and that's transformative. That's amazing. Uh, I could listen to this all day. Carol, with your producer's hat on, we talked more about your distribution role, but you're also a producer. You know, how are you seeing a tool like this, yeah, to help you exploit your own IP? Um, just sort of create a better ecosystem for producers. 
Uh, I'm just still thinking about what Ted said because my, <laughs> I'm, I'm, my mind's racing here about some other applications. I think it comes down to, uh, as a producer, to understand the IP. You know, when you're working with storytellers, where as producers we're trying to create um, stories and we want to obviously find the audience. And we just have to be mindful that um, the IP, which is that ultimate, the end product, if you will, is eminently uh, parsable. Um, and you have to understand that you need to utilize every aspect of that IP. And you can use tools like Artini. There are other tools also that expedite this, but just that you are more in control of your own destiny. Uh, and as a producer, I think it's our obligation to work with the storytellers to actually help them not only protect um, what they're doing, but most importantly, they're telling stories to be heard and finding a way to get them out. So, I mean, I, we probably would need a whole nother um, panel here about that, clearly. Um, at the bottom of it all is that Ted, Ted also said something um, very astute, which is that these company, that, that the little livers of space that are given us as producers to innovate, we have to jump into. Mm. Uh, and these mega companies that are out there that are changing things on their own, there's, there's always opportunity for innovation um, and, uh, you know, change making. So as a producer, that's what we really have to sort of focus on. But I, can't, I, I, I just can't even go on. If we had digress, <laughs> we'd be here forever. Great. We do have permission to go a few minutes late, so not hours late, Carol. But uh, so thank you to the Marche for that, because we I'd love to get to some of these audience questions, because I think there were things that Veet and Betty were wanting to talk about anyway. Um, so from Wendy Bernfeld. Hi, Wendy, who runs Right Stuff in Amsterdam um, and knows so much about this VOD world. She's wondering about sort of the business model behind this and, and what it would look like to a customer. Is there a setup fee? Do, is it subscription fees? Is it royalties based? Can you explain that? Yeah, it's, in fact, it's very simple. Yeah, there is no setup fee for like uploading, you know, or storage. There is a setup fee only for the white label, which is at the moment $1,000 just for the white label. And then for the delivery, for the public screening, so for the full one, it's a $20. Anywhere in the world, you can get the film in hours, in fact, one and a half hour, anywhere on the other part of the world for $20 in the full security. Uh, the TVOD uh, depends on the volume, but we're talking somewhere between one and a half, two dollars with all the security again. Okay, thank you. Let me just let yes. me just add something there, because in actual use, when we delivered uh, City of Ali, the film about Muhammad Ali, to the Muhammad Ali Center, we delivered it one time, but it was 20 authorizations because we gave them some tests and was booked. From our point of view as a distributor, that was a $20 delivery fee. The Muhammad Ali Center just had to download the Artini Cinema Player and they were dealing with the, um, you know, the box office on their end, which of course as a distributor, we got a portion of. But that is $20 for multiple um, you know, screenings of that film. And anybody who has ever sent a film someplace knows that there's a per DCP delivery cost. That's significantly more. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Eileen Sampson is asking, does Artini provide a, a free consultation to sort of talk you through how you might use this? Uh, it sounds like she might be maybe a producer, how, how a film can be monetized through working with you. Can, can somebody talk you through it? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, we have our email, which is artini at artini.com. It's two eyes at the end. Be okay, careful. we'll flash that up on the screen at the end. <laughs> so, And we have a great team in Prague. We're happy to jump on a Zoom, answer emails. We have tutorials. We have you know, uh, the website, which is quite self-explanatory. And we're always interested in sitting down with the people because then you can find the best solution for them. And oftentimes um, you offer something and then you realize that you can use more of our products than you initially thought. So I would definitely encourage anyone who's interested to drop us an email and we'll be happy to talk. Great. Daniel, can you tell us about... Add, oh, sorry, to, Carol, go I ahead. Have to, I have to add one more thing because of the... Uh, I think it's now 14 films that we have up on our white label and we're going to be... Uh, uh, you know, putting up some more. We just put up the Amir Barlev uh, epic film 
uh, about the Grateful Dead. And um, as a distributor, we also set the pricing for the end user in terms of how, you know, how many people do they want to have at the screening, how many times do they want to screen, and it's all, you know, it's all right up there on the um, white label in terms of the pricing. So I just wanted to add that. It's super simple. And I, I will just add it's even simpler because we take care of the VAT different in different countries. We have a payment gateway, so you don't have to worry. We take care of everything of that. Okay, and Daniel, you've been setting up this white label. I mean, how, how much do you sort of do on your own? How much do you feel like you need to talk to the team while you're setting that up? And have they been there, I hope, to, to answer your questions? Yeah, no, I, I would say the, the setup process was, uh, I think from, from our side, I would say we, we had uh, uh, work to do because, but that had nothing to do with Artini, but, but we really, because of this opportunity, we really looked at our library and then said, okay, now that we have this great opportunity, we really wanted to get uh, the best quality out there. So what we did on our side, we really overhauled. We, we took this really now as a, as, a, as, a, as a great reason for really overhauling our our library so we really looked at okay getting the best master out I think uh, it's very important that you have I would say in our I was philosophy it's really that we we try to have as many subtitles and dubs also as possible out there so that the people can watch it everywhere so we really had to do one share on our side to do that but uh, <coughs> that uh, I would say is something we had to do but I would say from the moment we had then everything ready for delivery really this was uh, we did to this really in a couple of days okay. and they were really super responsive so when we had some questions or some things that needed to be changed they were really all always uh, all the time there so that was really super fast so at some point it was a little bit actually it was a little bit too easy i would say it was so quick the process that i thought like wait a moment this should be more or so this can't be just this this clicks and they said like, no 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 everything's online everything's done it's good so therefore i think from that side it was super easy and betty who would you say i mean it sounds like you the company can work with lots of different kinds of clients a producer a sales company a festival um but do you have ideas about sort of who within each organization? Is it usually the IT guy? Is it, you know, who can you actually work with? Honestly, it's very varied. Okay. Um, so with Carol, there's a person who handles all the deliveries for the films and she's been uploading everything to the server and she was happy that it's super user friendly. Um, it's, you don't have to be an IT person. You don't have to be well versed in technology to be able to do it. Um, everything is on a laptop, on one dashboard. And again, as Daniel said, like, we're happy to help. We're there to help in case you do run to, into any issues. We have onboarding documents where we specify uh, what the film should look like, which container, what top title, uh, subtitle um, format we use and stuff. So you can prep in advance and we're able to do more on the back end if necessary. So we've done sub some uploads for some people from our side. But yeah, it's everyone. There is no pick or choose really. Like Okay, thank you. Um, just to mention, if anybody in the room here has a question, just... You can go to the mic, or we can bring the mic to you. So shout it out if you want. We're okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, who, who signs up with Artini? It's not the consumer doesn't need a, an account with you, or how does that work? So you as a rights holder, or a rights right. holder, would sign up via artini.pro. Uh, that's where our, your films will live, and you manage it from there. Um, and then as a user, you sign up via artini.com. You, all you need is an email and a password. Um, there is no cost to sign up. And once you're in uh, to do a screening, we ask you to set up a screening place, which is an address, a location, description, and the capacity. Because some prices are dependent to capacity, so that's why that's a requirement. And that's it. Um, this is just, of course, for the public screening, so you don't need it for a VOD. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, just another question coming in from the online audience about, can you tell us, kind of, you know, it can be confusing to see all these platforms out there. Which one do we choose? Which one is right for us? And somebody's asking, you know, what are some key differences with, between, you know, companies that we don't have time to get into all the companies, but, you know, Shift72 or Breaker or some of those 
companies, are they offering something similar or what's kind of the point of difference to explain to people? We don't want to comment on other companies, yeah. but we can say that our ecosystem is in one place. You manage everything from one location. You send it to the white label at the same time, add it to the marketplace at the same time, send it to a festival if you're invited, or just send it to your friends hosting a screening uh, somewhere outside. So that's our benefit, and that's something that we count as an advantage because it's a one stop for everything, really. Well, I would, I would, I would definitely add to that. I mean, as a user of the system, the difference is that originally Artini was set up for offline delivery, basically cinema anywhere, as their subhead says, and uh, that's what attracted us to the platform. As oftentimes the case, uh, technology companies have to adapt, and if they can adapt quickly, they add things. And Artini obviously added an online component with the advent of the pandemic. Um, they very quickly added the Tivon online component. So that there's some similarities with that component to other outfits, but in terms of uh, offline delivery, of point-to-point -point delivery of a single file or a curated group of files for a festival, uh, I have not yet run across any other entity that does that. As is often the case, I'm sure there will be other entities that say, hey, wait a second, we got to jump into this. Um, but I don't, you know, this, this is totally different. And from a distributor point of view, it gives us all the tools that we need at our desktop. And we see what's going on because we have to report back to the IP owner mm. of the film. We want to be able to tell them everything. Well, where did your film screen? How many people were there? Are you sure it didn't get, uh, you know, d shown multiple more times? Well, yeah, because we see it on our platform. Ted said something, no more middlemen. Hmm. So it's very, very interesting. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm being told we do f probably have to start wrapping up on time. So Veet and Betty, especially, do, was there anything else you think people who are watching this need to know about how this works and how to find you? Okay, the first I want to thank you to all, you know, yes. I couldn't speak much, but it's good. <laughs> you are so great. So it was perfect. Thank you. You covered everything. I think you heard everything. I'm quite glad that even we presenting us as a technology, we still, thanks to that, came back to the uh, original idea of the communities, community driven distribution. So we still there. I like it. And I say it's the first idea and at the end it's always the best. So we just brought some more technology into this original idea. So. I think you probably heard everything. If not, just pop up us on, on, on the email. We respond very quickly. We'll be in touch with you. Or if you want to meet us, still we are here until Tuesday. Uh, so we can meet in person if you want. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. I want to thank Viet and Betty and also your colleagues who are not on stage with you who have been really helpful in planning this session. Thanks. Amazing to hear from Ted and Daniel and Carol and Brian. Um, thanks to the Marche and Count Next, uh, Sten, Guillaume, Jerome, Alexandra, all the team. Thank you. And thank you so much for the audience who's actually joined us in the room. It's exciting to be in front of real people. And thanks you again to, uh, we know you have, you know, limitless options of things to tune into online. So thank you to everybody who's tuned in online. Ted. I, I of course, have a closing remark. Le we need a closing uh, remark from Ted Hope, don't we? What else yeah. is new? What else is new? Very good. Please. Uh, you know, it, it's curious. Like, I I was, uh, I would say, and Brian and Carole, both of us, I died in the wool New Yorker. I made my life committed. I was never going to leave New York. Brian and I had an ill-fated venture together building an app. Brilliant idea. It didn't work, but it taught me a little bit about the tech world and the VC world. And I started to, to notice something, that there are qualities that you've heard that I wanted to bring into my professional practice and creative practice of being nimble and flexible, right? Uh, of not accepting the way things are as good enough. And it led me to move first to San Francisco and then to, to, to Los Angeles. But it, it's pinpointed by a kind of a clear observation that I think like for those in the room or at home watching this, I encourage to hold close and dear. And that we are always taught that, you know, the, the market, you know, uh, is wise and can create, 
you know, new opportunities and we'll find the best solution. But I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I found that in my industry, the one that brings us all here together, you know, art, the artists, the audiences, and art itself evolved much faster than the business or the marketplace. We are so dependent on having people committed to technology that are committed to not just holding on to a single idea, but to evolving it around the needs of that community to advance our enterprise. The, the opportunities that I've had in my, my life come from not settling that the market was sorted out, but to say the artists and the audiences will sort, sort it out. So when you, if you want to have pattern recognition to, towards the future, i.e. your own private crystal ball to future cast, you know, you want to kind of say, I will not settle for what the market decides. I will look for what the artists and the art, art and the technologists will bring us. Like, there's a better future, and it's in our grasp. Wonderful. Everybody go out and start your own band, metaphorically. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Thank you to everybody, and thanks Thank for tuning you. in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.